Welcome back. It's day 184 of my Growing Passion Fruit from Seed series. The overflow tray concept is working out very nicely. You can see all the overflow there. At some point I ran out of the ability to provide distilled water for this plant. It just needs way too much water for that. So I started using tap water in my showering can, just liters and liters at a time. And in the previous episode I discussed uh, you know, some leaves being curled, maybe that's due to an overabundance of nutrients. This one is a good example. It's kind of ruffled on the edges, although it looks otherwise very healthy. It's very verdant and green. So uh, it's got all these, uh, you know, offshoots growing in the wrong direction. Still not sure whether this is intended to grow underneath the canopy of something else. I would think so, as with most vines, and it would take a while for them to reach all the way to the top of the canopy. So there's like some beige scars there, sort of whitish, on the base of the main stem. I don't know where those came from. It's not like I scratched it or uh, brushed against it with a rough object. And you've got some of those intermediate leaves with two prongs and a lot of uh, just kind of starter looking leaves with just one prong. So there's a big one with two prongs, and the ones that go over the balcony, you know, that I tied down with this green string. Now some of them look burned, and, you know, back when I did the honeydew growing series in 2013, you know, I had a lot of problems uh, with my leaves. I think just all the heat um, reflecting off the concrete, you know, just roasted a lot of leaves. So I'm not sure what the problem is. But um, that's my theory, and I've been watering from the top continuously like this. Um, I think at this point in the filming, I was still using distilled water. And then later on, in the end of April 2017, when this was filmed, I just uh, started using lots of tap water. So uh, tap water is okay if you can get you know, tons of flow through because you could just wash out all the excess minerals. It's day 198, and there's been some more growth. Uh, the leaves haven't really gotten bigger, but there's more of them. There's more vine growth. The vines are longer, and I pretty much um, shoved all the offshoots through the railings or tied them to the top of the, the main rail. So they're just growing up freely, and you can see thin yellowish spots on some of the ones that are more exposed to the afternoon sun although that one's not even over the rail and these older leaves that are just big and sort of ruffled or uh, curled like that I mean they're doing their job I mean they're really big uh, I'm really surprised that no leaves have turned yellow yet and fallen off so there's evidence that suggests that these tiny cuttings are alive and growing I originally noticed them you know, I cut up everything in, was it episode 2 or 3, and just threw it down there from the other three vines that I tried to grow in the beginning of this series. And, you know, I planted some of those uh, perpendicular into the soil. I think they survived this entire time just by uh, drinking water while um, lying parallel to the ground, you know, because they were immersed in potting mix particles and getting watered every two days uh, they were just passively absorbing water so I took them out they had no roots and then uh, you know I, I sort of planted them as deep as I could which is not much because there were tiny cuttings everything else all those like clippings and uh, whatnot that I cut up pretty much uh, died and formed this artificial uh, leaf litter that provides uh, nutrient recycling back to the soil so that leaf looks to be in rough shape. You can see all these other uh, new leaf primordia popping up. Lots of really long tendrils, as I showed in the previous episode. They can get up to a foot long. I actually don't really like them in this context, uh, you know, because they never end up curling around the rails. Uh, the rails are too thick, so they just end up uh, latching on to other areas of stem and strangulating them. Uh, they constrict the growth. So I always have to cut them. So it's day 213. So there's continued growth, uh, but I'm always asking the question, are the vines healthy? In this case, it's just one vine. 
foliage looks okay overall. You know, nothing really wrong with the uh, the shade of the green and the overall coloration. Uh, some of these leaves look to be roasted and disfigured, but uh, there's nothing I can really do about that. You know, if I had everything going inwards, there would just be no room. Uh, my sweet Annie is really big it's an annual but I decided you know I can't just sacrifice that and have uh, this vine choke around it um, inside the balcony I don't think long term any of those solutions are viable people are always like you know you should get a trellis or a, a wire mesh or something but using the balcony rail is the really the only practical solution and it gets it way more afternoon sun starting from past noon um, you know, depending on the angle of the sun and the season, uh, it might take until 2 or 3 p.m. sometimes to get full afternoon sun hitting this uh, inside of the balcony. So we're looking at these again, and they're getting bigger. So I don't know if they have roots yet. I don't want to disturb anything, but I've been watering every two days. And, you know, it's pretty impressive that these tiny little cuttings have survived that long. In fact, it takes a lot of those leaves that I cut up and uh, leaf fragments to just turn yellow and finally dehydrate and die. They last for a really long time. So I drained that tray and it's going a little dry again. Because I have the watering tray hole facing the other way, I had to do that reorientation to get the vine to go over the balcony rail. I don't really have a good idea of how full the watering tray of the pot itself is at all times it's facing the other side um, but if I overwater I'll notice uh, stuff in the collection tray so that's basically how I know can't go too long uh, without watering from the top this is a very thirsty plant like most mines so um, one thought is I'm washing these leaves uh, that are close to the base of the stem and those seem to be the healthiest at all times and there's you know maybe one or two at the bottom that kind of annoy me because they always uh, get wet and touch the bottom of the wet soil but they haven't been burned or anything by fertilizer they haven't uh, rotted yet so it just goes to show my theory of you know like wet leaves touching the soil that doesn't always uh, portend doom you know, if your plant's healthy, it can uh, survive a lot of that stuff. And this has a lot of big leaves that can just go over the edge, so it's not even a problem. So it's day 234. It's been a really long time. Um, I siphoned out the overflow catch tray twice. A uh, bee drowned in here. You know, it gets kind of disgusting after a while, especially just due to the coloration. But I think, as I mentioned in episode 3, it's so concentrated with fertilizer in there that bugs and mosquitoes can't get a foothold and it drowns out a lot of uh, the fungus gnat larvae you know so the new seedling over there I think just came from a seed that germinated very late and it's yellow it's just like the ones before there are some yellow leaves there so you know at the end of this uh, video I have a footnote that just says I fertilized after this episode ended with a packet of miracle Grow and a crushed multivitamin. So these uh, vine offshoots are just going everywhere. See, that doesn't look healthy at all. And then, you know, those just look roasted. Maybe they're just too close to the concrete. So it's an unnatural environment, I know. I let that tendril over there just kind of curl onto a leaf petiole. Not doing much damage. If they uh, bind to each other, that's fine too. As you can see, there are two leaf tendrils just curled. So some of these are really, really curly, and uh, you can see a little bug over there. I don't know what that is. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not really good with my uh, ornithoptera or whatever. You know, I, I don't know what that is. It's some other kind of bug, flying bug, that just landed there. I don't know how many of these are sap suckers, so to speak. Uh, you know, leaf hopper, scale insects, or whatever. But uh, this leaf doesn't look to be in too bad of a shape compared to how bad the honeydew leaves used to get. I, I think there's a little bit of uh, gray mildew on there. Very careful to switch gloves after I film this uh, section of the episode and you know switch to filming my other plants. I don't want to pass that around. But 
it's pretty much a hallmark of vines. If you look at my um, other two melon vine series from 2013, 2014, that's basically how it goes. Like uh, once you reach a certain critical mass of growth and you just have really long vines and too many leaves, doesn't matter if, it, if it's indoors or outdoors, you're going to get some kind of mold and raw and dead spots. Uh, it's just uh, going to be completely different of an experience compared to many other plants. Uh, you know, like Joshua tree, it's not very big, but the leaves are meant to continuously die off in that, as you can see from all my wild footage from Joshua Tree National Park. But I don't really have a frame of reference to uh, wild vines outdoors for, uh, you know, things like this, melon vines and uh, passion fruit vines and whatnot. I could definitely say, though, that uh, California wild grapevines uh, have huge, uh, for the most part, very healthy looking leaves in the outside. It looks like they're covered in spider mite webbings, though, but they never get to the point where, you know, they've just got mold growing on them outright. And, uh, yeah, so basically there are some yellow leaves there. The stem keeps getting thicker and thicker. It's like pinky thick now, but, um... You know, aside from fertilizing and just waiting and doing more watering, I don't really know what I can do 